I live in the very southernmost part of the state of Illinois, very rural, uh, in, in the heart of the Shawnee National Forest. And unfortunately, three of the five poorest counties in the state of Illinois border the county that I live in. So we're well accustomed to, if you will, poverty and low resource individuals, if you will, in sort of a domestic case here. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at, uh, again, if I didn't mention it, it's great to be with you today. Uh, today, we're going to look at a different case. We're going to look at a case of a young lady, uh, Susan, who is facing some really interesting dilemmas. And you can advance the slide, please, Madhu. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're going to look at uh, just a small, very small snippet of Susan's life today. And I think I want to make you know really apparent to everybody is that this is not some made up case study. This is an actual lived life uh, that I happen to be aware of. And we're going to see if we can help Susan today kind of navigate some of the situations and position that she's in with the idea of trying to understand her context through her eyes and help guide her if we can. All right, next slide, please, Madhu. Um, let's talk about the dilemma. She is recently divorced. Uh, she had a very abusive husband. All of the, of the family's resources were tied up with the husband. The husband had the credit card. The husband had the credit rating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, Susan had very, very limited exposure in terms of work or what have you. Uh, again, she was in a very abusive relationship, both emotionally and physically. Uh, she managed to get a, a divorce and a restraining order and all the things that go with it. But because she has little to no resources of her own, she's really kind of out on her ear, so to speak. Uh, she had the opportunity to move out of her home into the women's shelter. Uh, but that time is now expired. She's got to move on. She found a place in the public housing authority that would allow her to have a small two bedroom uh, apartment. And you can see kind of a picture of it there in the bottom left hand. Now, the thing that's really imminent here is that Susan's on her own. She has very few resources, not a lot of family, uh, not a lot of family here to work within the context of backup or what have you, as Professor Medu has talked about that, you know, those resources that are there, those contingencies that you can have. Susan's pretty well facing forward right now. She's looking at the future. Uh, she's got a really unique opportunity. She had a chance to get a job interview. And this is the dilemma that we want to kind of look at today. The job interview literally is today. She's got to face it this afternoon. Just got a call. She's got to go now and take the interview. All right, but here's the dilemma, if you will. She has two small children, three-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl. Uh, she has now just moved into this housing project, knows very, very few people, very few people here. Uh, she does have transportation. You can see that fine looking Dodge product there. I think it's a Dodge or a Chevrolet van product there. It's ugly, but it runs and it'll get her to the job interview. Uh, the question is, she desperately needs this job, but what is she going to do? She has about an hour to figure this out. Now, let's think about it. She's got to get there. She's got to get, get herself put together to where she can go for the interview. She has two children. What is she going to do with them while she's trying to get this interview undertaken? Remember, mom is miles away in the next day. She has very, very little friends, anything else in the neighborhood. So what we want you to do, we want you to contemplate this idea with all the constraints that Susan has to work with right now. We want to take you to this QR code. If you'll take your phone. Next yeah. slide. One, please. There you go. If you'll take this QR code, place it, you're going to see some opportunities <clears throat> that exist. You can also tap in or write in your own answer to the dilemma. Yeah. But we've got to get this done quickly. Yeah. Sorry, Ron. Do it individually, Sorry. okay? Yeah. Thank you. So, and again, folks online, if you'll take your, your phone out, if you'd like, take a snapshot of this QR code, answer the question. What's she going to do? Remember, desperately needs this job. It is the beginning for her. Got to get here.
Give you just another moment. And we'll put up the put up the slides here. Okay. I'm gonna let you share. I know you're ready. Yep. I will in just a moment here. We're gonna get everything ready to go. Yeah. Once For whatever done, reason, put away your cell phones, okay? Sign me out. Just a second, we will have this ready to roll. All right, and let's look at the response rates, okay? Let's take a peek here. And here we go. Uh, the large majority of you say that the best option for Susan is to see if people, sorry, see if people at the women's shelter will in fact watch the children while she goes to the interview. Uh, take the children with her. Uh, can you imagine in this highly competitive labor market world today, taking children, two, th a three-year-old boy <laughs> and a six-year-old girl to you and try to have a serious interview with an HR person while the six-year-old's running around the office and the three-year-old's crying on your lap? Uh, how much would that endear you to the ER, I mean, to the staff there at the business? Uh, you know, leave the children, take the children. Uh, what's she going to do here? You notice how widely the opinions vary here. This is really complex issue. Uh, chances are good the staff, the women's shelter, probably at this moment, her best bet, if they're available. Remember, it's late in the day. And it may be really, really hard for her to get in here. All right. All right. Let's take and consider the next element, please. So if you already share that for me, Madhu. Yes. Guess what? Here's the good news. She got the job. The very thing she was wanting. But the job starts Monday morning. I mean, literally, Monday morning. She's, she's front and center Monday morning. Now, think about this for a moment. Two small children. No budget for clothing. I mean, again, she's a receptionist for a fairly upscale office building. Uh, good basic skills, good people skills, but uh, she's got to she got to put her act together. Got to do something with her hair, probably. Got to get a little better wardrobe going for herself. Very, very limited on funds. Not only that, but the children now are going to need some type of daycare provision. And you may or may not be aware of it, but daycare for a single three-year-old child can cost literally hundreds of dollars a week. Now, she's going to have $16 an hour starting wage here, which, again, for her level is is a, a modest, you know, modest wage. But again, and, and she's just tight. She she's just can't hardly make all of this work. So the question now is, she's got her job. Now, how is she going to get it and keep it? So once again, we're going to ask you to look at the next QR code. Again, flash this up. Take a shot of that. Look at the options that are there. If you've got a better one, put it in for me. But let's see what you say here. Read through the responses. If you think one of them is the best option, select it. If not, click on other and type it in. All right. Most of you have responded here. Let's take a quick look. Yeah. One minute. There you go. And folks, if you're done with your cell phones, please put it away. We won't need it again for a while. Okay. Please put it away where it doesn't tempt you. Backpack or pocket. Go ahead, Noah. All right. Let's take a quick look here. <laughs> All right. How's she going to manage this? Well, uh, many of you say that, you know, there might be an option for a predatory payday loan. 
In other words, she can go out and borrow money to provision for child care, perhaps buy a wardrobe, uh, get herself put together and then worry later about how she's going to pay that off. Uh, forget daycare, pay somebody in the uh, in the project. Think about this for a moment. Again, a young six-year-old girl, a three-year-old boy, people you rarely know, hardly, you've not been there long enough, you really don't know who they are, and yet would you walk off all day and leave your children with some stranger, perhaps? Uh, you know, one out of seven say, you know, get an evening job, you know, get <laughs> You know, get a side hustle, find some other way to provide resources for uh, what's necessary. That's also very doable. Um, borrow money from mom again. I'm here to tell you mom is at, mom's over it. She's tapped out. No resources available for mom. So once again, very few tenable, really good options that Susan has here. And this is one of the things we want to kind of leave you with in, in terms of this very brief little scenario is that this is the context of life as Susan knows it day in and day out. This is not uh, just a, a happenstance, you know, a one, one out of a thousand opportunity. This is the context of the constraints, the difficulties, the problems, uh, the, the low resources she has to be, to, to make do with. And once again, She's really working hard to try to do the right thing and make it work for herself. Yet, in so many situations, uh, we find the environment, the, the situation, and the systems that are in place are very, very much against her in terms of her trying to do well. So I hope you'll take this into context, look at it from a standpoint of how it might affect your decision making about what would be best. Because again, here, we were looking through Susan's eyes. We were trying to see the options she knew of and she saw and then tried to make the best decision we could from those. So again, keep that in mind as we as we go forward here. Okay, thank you, Madhu. Yeah, so uh, uh, Ron, I'm just going to have you hold on. I'm just going to give them a small exercise, which is can you now just do this exercise one more time. Imagine your project is on this case. One more time, just see if there are any different drivers or larger concepts that are in these categories. So now we just consider this one. Okay? So go ahead and put that down. Okay, again, imagine this is the context. Okay, so one more time. I'll give you a minute and then we'll go back to Ron and I have a few questions for him. If this were the context, does it change? If your project is in this context, does it change uh, anything? Okay. Just to simulate your thinking. <clears throat> Can you avoid I have to three or four times, it's quite evident, right? Very good. Okay, Ron, uh, I think we are ready. Go ahead. So, Ron, I have a few questions for you. Okay. Uh, tell us about yourself. How did you grow up? Um, I was a fairly typical young young boy growing up in southernmost Illinois. Uh, my parents were very, you know, middle class. Uh, dad worked in real estate and uh, insurance sales. Uh, mom was around the home, but she did some secretarial work from time to time and worked as an administrative aide at the local hospital. Uh, fairly standard upbringing until I got to the age of 13. And then within a period of less than six months, uh, both my parents became, you know, catastrophically disabled. My mother had a very, very bad back injury. And uh, just a few weeks after that, my dad had a very, very significant stroke. And so at the age of 13, I was left with uh, very little support mechanisms. I was an only child, uh, no family members to speak of around <laughs> on either side of the family. 
And so we were pretty well left to kind of fend for ourselves. Our parents had a little bit of savings, but that dwindled very quickly because, uh, again, there was no money coming in. So at age 13, I became the primary breadwinner for our family. I was very fortunate. I was a really big kid. I was a tall kid at that age and uh, was big enough to do a man's work at age 13. And where we lived, Madhu, in a rural agricultural area, there were always opportunities to go work out on farms, work with animals, work with machinery uh, almost throughout the year. Uh, we started doing that on a real regular basis after work. As soon as I got old enough to get what was known here in Illinois as a job permit, you know, you can be permitted to work. Uh, I started working in a small warehouse, driving a fork truck, lifting, toting, carrying, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was it was very difficult, very difficult period uh, through high school uh, until we sort of got stabilized. And and uh, my mom and dad, again, never recovered uh, fully. And until the time we were married, we were, in essence, supporting the family as a whole. And even after marriage, uh, we, we did a lot of support for them. So it was uh, very traumatic for a period of time for me. So what about your education, Ron? Um, I was, and again, a way fortunate in the fact that um, high school was was something that we could get done. We'd go to school, learn today, and work all night. You know, go home, do a little homework, get up in the morning, go to school, go to work, wash, rinse, repeat. Uh, and once we graduated uh, out of high school, we had the chance to go to community college, and then, uh, in a, to make a very long story short, it took me 13 years to get my undergraduate degree, first undergraduate degree. Uh, from that time on, I was very fortunate enough to get some work with a larger company. I married, had a Fortune 200 company that took me on. We were able to get another undergraduate degree and then finally a master's degree. And now we're working on a doctoral program uh, okay. to finish, to put the you know, icing on that cake. So, Ron, the question I had for you, I mean, I've known you since 2013. You've been with me to Kenya and Tanzania, <clears throat> and Uganda, India. You worked on Marketplace, let's see, with low-income people in Illinois and, you know, all over the world. Why didn't you run away from all this? Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the thought would always kind of cross your mind. But... Uh, had it not been for a, a very select group of people that took me on and said, you know, hey, there's something here, you know, this, this kid needs a break. Uh, never, I think something is important too, never got a handout. It was never a thing to where, you know, son, here's some money, you know, go do something. It wasn't that. It was, hey, I have a job. I have some work. Uh, again, you know, that kind of Midwestern farm mentality, let's, let's go work and we'll earn money. Uh, I had a lot of people that worked with me that gave me opportunities to work. I got a lot of different experiences, uh, you know, uh, in terms of that work. And I just look back on that and say, you know, gee whiz, had it not been for those individuals who saw something in me, who were willing to invest their money in, in, in me and their time in me to help me, uh, there's no telling where I would be. So I see that sort of as not necessarily paying it forward. But I see it as part of my ethos is that, you know, that was provision for me. That's what sustained me. That's what made me um, able to be here today. And uh, I think other people deserve that same that same opportunity I had. And where I can, I want to be a part of providing that. So, Ron, uh, one of the things I've noticed about you and, uh, you know, is I can put you in front of any audience. And I have, whether it's Chicago, of course, um, southernmost Illinois or Kenya and India and so on, uh, I really like how open-minded you are, you know, and no, no matter who you meet. So uh, you've told me a little bit about this before. Where does that come from? Uh, you know, I appreciate that, Madhu, and that uh, it's one of the things <clears throat> that I think makes us effective in a lot of ways is that, you know, we try to see people for, you know, just exactly what they are and who they are uh, and, and don't bring anything to that you know, to that table. My, I'm always reminded of this situation with my father uh, back in the day. And again, you got to realize this is way back when in the last century, I love saying it, uh, but uh, we were still heating with coal. I was a young boy, about age 10, I think it was in fourth, fifth grade, something like that. And we still had a heater that burnt coal. And so you had to have coal delivered. Well, there was a group of gentlemen in town that delivered this coal and they were 
all of African American descent. Now you got to realize in a small uh, community in southernmost Illinois, we're very homogenous. Uh, you know, not not a lot of folks from African American descent in our neighborhood, in our region. And so the jobs that were available were very low end jobs, again, much as what we've talked about people doing here. But they came and they delivered a load of coal and my dad paid them and, you know, they were gone and what have you. And, and about 20 minutes later, there was, you know, a knock at the door. And it's the two gentlemen, the two, two gentlemen that delivered the coal. And uh, they wanted to know if dad had been outside or anything because they had apparently between getting from the door out to the truck and getting everything put together. They had managed to misplace the money that my dad had given them for the coal. Uh, now, you know, many of us would would consider that to be, well, you know, sorry about that. Or, you know, hey, you know, click, I'll turn the porch light on for you. Good luck. Um, my dad went, got his boots on, put his raincoat on, got his hat, and went out and spent the next 20 minutes looking for the money with these jobs. And that that experience, for whatever reason, has stuck with me, uh, realizing that, you know, no matter who you are, what you are, where you're at in life, uh, you know, we're all equal in that context of, you know, that that if we can be there for each other, it's going to be a much better place and a much better world for everybody. And so that very much broadened my perspectives. I was very fortunate, in fact, that my parents, although not well exposed to lots of cultures and what have you were very open about the idea of, you know, recognizing differences and understanding people and doing the best you can to try to, to, to understand where they are at from that perspective. And that has really, really stuck with me throughout the years. I'm, I'm actually, Ron, and I first met you in 2013, I asked you to do poverty simulation. You've done that for hundreds of our students. Only a few years later, I realized the first time you ever did a poverty simulation was for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say that I don't think any, I know of anybody, maybe I know of one other person who's not with us anymore, yes, yeah. who did the poverty simulation as well as you. Really appreciate you for who you are. Thank you for working with our LMU students. We worked with more than 3,000 students now. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate You're welcome. It. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks so much.